And after a series of observational efforts, I think um, people now have um, a statistical sample of spectrally, spectroscopically confirmed uh, UDGs in coma cluster and in other uh, galaxy clusters or groups. And these samples seem to show that UDGs are red and old in the center of the clusters or groups. They are younger in the outskirts, and they're mostly star forming and show a wide range of colors in the field. So the, the simple picture that the, the, observa the observations are trying to put forward, I think, is the simple uh, scenario that uh, UDGs form in the field, fall into, galax fall into galaxy groups and clusters, and get environmentally processed and become red UDGs in coma. So I think given the data quality um, so far, we have a sample of several, like 25, right? 30-ish, uh, um, it's kind of hard to very convincingly establish this picture because A, um, we still need to rely on the projected distances and line of sight velocities, and B, uh, uh, the sample is uh, small, right? Um, so why don't we just simulate UDGs? Because it's kind of hard in simulations. Um, so here is a, a check table, checklist. Uh, do we have UDGs simulated in the field? Yes, we do. Um, actually, uh, Ariana De Cincio et al. Um, were among the first to look for UDGs in the Nihao simulation. So do we have UDGs as satellites? Do we have UDGs in clusters in particular? Not really. So TK Chen sitting in the audience uh, who told us last year that you can cleverly manually quench uh, the UDGs or the, the galaxies in the fire simulation to mimic what will happen in a dense environment. But that approach, of course, cannot fully capture the environmental processes like tidal interaction. It only captures the fact that satellite will quench at, at some point in the group, in the, in the cluster. Do we have UDGs in SAM energy models? Not really, because you get what you put in. Because in SAMs, the galaxy size is explicitly linked to halo spin. And I will show you shortly, this is wrong. So we have a recent paper that uh, discusses why the size recipe uh, that is widely used in SAM energy models may be wrong. So the, the simple explanation for the theoretical works to lag behind the, uh, the observations is, is that it's simply expensive to simulate uh, satellite ultra-diffuse galaxies. But I'm really excited to see uh, Mike Trammell will talk about um, the Romulus C sim uh, simulation on Friday, I think, uh, which may potentially be an ideal sample uh, for studying uh, UDGs. So in this work, we try to use simulations. Um, we elaborate on the sample that the Sinshou used, the Nihao simulation, and we also use a simulation of a galaxy group to try to answer these questions. Are UDGs special? For example, given the low Cersic indices, are they oblate in morphology? Are they special in halo spin? Are they just the high spin tail of galaxies? How to form UDGs? So the Nihao sample, just to remind you, um, consists of 90 isolated galaxies with viral mass in the range between 10 to the 9.5 to 12.3 solar masses. It's an SPH simulation. It has decent numerical resolution, which varies with mass scale such that uh, for pretty much all the galaxies, they are safely resolved down to 1% of the viral radius. So here we plot the Nihao sample on the size versus stellar mass plane. Each square is a Nihao galaxy, color-coded by the surface brightness. And if they meet the UDG criteria, we highlight them with red edges. You can immediately see that UDGs prefer this mass range of 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. But you also see that this mass range is dominated by diffuse systems. That is to say, the, the other galaxies, which are not UDGs, that fall in this mass range are also quite diffuse. Okay. They just barely miss, uh, they just marginally miss one of the two criteria. 
Um, in comparison, these two dashed lines are from observations, are median size mass relations from observations. Um, and you can see this hump here. Um, but just to mention, the simulation benchmarks are only accurate down to 10 to the 9 solar masses, meaning that these ranges are extrapolations. But we know for sure, observationally, we have ultra-compact dwarfs and compact el ellipticals here. So obviously, the simulations are not reproducing compact things. And it's not unique in our Nihao simulation. So we overplot the fire simulation and another simulation based on the gizmo code. All of them show a hump behavior in this range, and they don't produce a lot of uh, compact things. Bearing this caveat in mind, okay, which may tell you that um, the feedback of the simulations are too strong, producing uh, two puffy objects. We want to proceed and to compare the UDGs with, say, the Milky Ways and to the other galaxies that are in the same mass range to see if UDGs are special. So here are the distributions of a bunch of quantities, contrasting UDGs in red to the rest of the Nihau sample in gray. Okay? So the first two panels show you the halo mass and the stellar mass. You can see the UDGs prefer a narrow halo mass range and a stellar mass range. And we define a normal dwarf galaxies as those that are not UDGs but lie in the same mass ranges. We define Milky Way analogs as systems with viral mass larger than 10 to the 11.5 solar masses. So you see right away that UDGs are not special in specific star formation rate or in color. They are not spe very special in circuit indices, and they are not fast rotators in terms of the rotation speed over uh, dispersion at uh, half mass radius. Um, they are not special in halo spin parameter but they are quite special regarding the, the density profile of their halos. So the NFW concentration is lower than what is expected for this mass range. And related, the inastal shape, is, which measures the curvature of the density profile, is higher than uh, what's expected from n-body simulations. This tells you that the host halos of UDGs have responded significantly to baryonic processes. This topic I won't elaborate on because uh, Jonathan Frederick has a nice talk in the morning, and uh, Arena De Sincho et al. 2017 has um, proposed similar ideas. We want to focus on the shape of UDGs. So we measure the semi-axis of the ellipsoid that describes the uh, stellar component of the galaxies, and we construct uh, two parameters, the elongation and the flattening uh, of the galaxies such that uh, galaxies of different shapes are well separated into the four corners. You can see that, as expected, right, Milky Ways um, are more oblate than average, whereas UDGs, although they have similar cystic indices to the Milky Ways, are more prolate. In the prolate quarter, it's dominated by ultra-diffuse galaxies. So here, when you check cystic index versus shape, you see that they are barely correlated to, with each other. So the low circuit indices doesn't tell you that they are oblate systems. Instead, they are more prolate than average. So the more interesting stuff uh, in the galaxy group. Um, we use a um, group size object, first simulated by Dutton et al., uh, round to ratio zero with an okayish. Uh, numerical resolution, so given the typical UDG size, which is about 3 kpc, um, I think they are decently uh, resolved in this simulation. Uh, the most straightforward thing to check, right, just to mimic what observers would do, is to um, plot the specific star formation rate or the color as a function of the distance to the group center. Keep in mind that the scenario observers want to establish is that UDGs form in the field, uh, get environmentally processed, and become red in the cluster. So here we do the same, except that distances are 3D, intrinsic distances. And very encouragingly, we reproduce the trend um, that rather things are more towards the center 
and outside the viral radius in the field, uh, there is a wide range of colors. We also find the following things interesting. When we plot the cellular mass of UDGs at pressure zero versus distance to the center, and the effective radii as a function of distance to the center, we see that the radial profiles are almost flat. So this is interesting because it's related to um, whether tidal stripping is important in making the red UDGs in the center. So naively, you would expect the tidal stripping to make things smaller, right? lower in mass and smaller in size uh, because uh, the stars on the outskirts are removed. But here you see a flat distribution. We will re return to this very shortly, but before that, let me show you the three typical examples of UDG evolution in the galaxy group. So here is one galaxy, one satellite. From the top to the bottom, I show you the orbital radius, the dark matter mass, the stellar mass, the cold gas mass, the, the half mass radius, the kinetic energy in the stars, and the kinetic energy to potential energy ratio. So if this ratio is 0.5, it indicates that the system is in zero equilibrium. So the line is a function of redshift. Today is here and um, uh, early times is here. Uh, this particular galaxy become a satellite at redshift about 1.5 and travels to the first Paris center at a redshift of about 0.7. Um, when it goes into an UDG phase, we highlight it in red edges. So you can see immediately that many interesting things happen at the first Paris center. First of all, it loses a lot of uh, dark matter mass, meaning that tidal stripping is operating actively. But the stellar mass remains roughly the same, meaning that the tidal stripping is not very important in the baryonic range of the galaxy. But at the same time, you lose your cold gas completely, which seems to suggest that the other quenching mechanism, which is ram pressure, is more important uh, in making red UDGs. Um, you can see this size increase right at the pericenter. And associated with size increase, there is a spike in kinetic energy of stars, and the system deviates from viral equilibrium and relaxes back to viral equilibrium. This is an exemplary example of tidal heating that you will see in textbooks. Okay. So meaning that tidal heating um, at the pericenter passage can puff up some galaxies that were accredited as normal galaxies. Besides this, we also have galaxies that are created as UDGs and survive the dense environment. And besides that, we also have galaxies that are created as UDGs but couldn't survive the environment and get disrupted at some point. So, except for the difference at accretion, as long as they survive, they pretty much show very similar behaviors regarding size increase and energetics. So after seeing these individual examples, let me show you the average trend between um, the info of a satellite and the final uh, time when the satellite remains gravitationally bound. For the sake of time, let's focus on the surviving population, which is represented by the, the solid, the bright symbols. So the average location on the parameter space um, at accretion is represented by triangles. This shows you the subhalo mass and the, on the right, this shows you the, the stellar mass. You can see that while the, the satellites in the two uh, mass beams at accretion um, lose a lot of dark matter mass, but their stellar mass only decreases marginally. This explains the flat radial profile of the, uh, of the stellar mass that we have seen previously. Satellites generally grow in size okay, from accretion to uh, redshift to zero. Okay. Maybe more so for the lower mass systems. But why do we see the flatness in our E distribution? Um, basically because of the progenitor bias. Uh, galaxies of the same mass which are accreted at, uh, today are larger in size than galaxies that are accreted at earlier times. So this explains the flatness of the R E distribution. And so the formation rate, uh, nothing special to mention, Galaxies generally quench when, you, when they travel to the inner parts. Before I summarize the, uh, the many things I've told you, 
I want to elaborate a little bit on the tidal heating issue. Okay. The subtle thing is that tidal heating and tidal stripping happen hand in hand. So you get a, kin a kinetic energy boost when you travel to the, um, to the pericenter. If the boost is very strong, then the particles on the outskirts are stripped right away. So you are not left with an energy increment to expand the system. So there must exist an optimal regime where tidal heating can happen. And we try to find this optimal regime by following uh, the prescri prescription by uh, Gnadian et al. So we take an average orbit in a cosmological simulation. We calculate the, uh, the, the velocity increase due to tides over one full orbit. We calculate the tidal heating energy, and we uh, integrate the tidal heating energy to compute the total heating uh, deposited to the part of the satellite within the satellite-centric radius L. So we can define the truncation radius, which is the solution to the equation that the local heating energy is equal to the local binding energy, okay, which is represented by the vertical line here. So beyond this line, everything is stripped. And only below this line, there is some small range of the heating regime. Although this range seems to be small, when you integrate it, you get about 50% of the total binding energy. Okay? So you get a tidal heating energy that amounts up to 40%, 50% in one orbit compared to the binding energy of the system. So tidal heating is indeed a significant thing and is a viable channel for making, uh, for making uh, ultra-diffuse galaxies out of normal dwarf galaxies in dense environments. So I think, I hope I've answered these two questions, how to form UDGs in the, in the galaxy groups. So we have three channels. Normal dwarfs can survive. Um, a normal dwarfs can get puffed up. Field UDGs can fall in and get quenched and survive and the field UDGs can fall in and get disrupted. Um, so regarding our UDG special, they are not special in halo spin. They are quite special in halo density profiles, and they have relatively high dark matter fraction within RE. They have low surface indices, but they are quite prolate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 